Ronald, it's so wonderful to be with you. For those who haven't met you before, could you tell us a bit about yourself, uh, where you were, were born, and um, about your background? Well, uh, it's a great joy to be with you, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I was born, born in Peter Mausburg, Natal, South Africa, and I came over to Cambridge in 1956. And the most significant thing that happened to me at Cambridge was that I became a Christian from an atheistic background. I had very deliberately given up Christianity. And so by the time I reached Cambridge, I was asked some really big questions, all to do with what kind of a universe are we living in? And so I became a Christian at that time, my first Sunday back to Cambridge. And the only other thing I need to tell you that is significant to our story today is that I met the Shapers in Cambridge uh, not long after we began. We started in 1955. And they visited us in Cambridge in the middle of 1958, June 1958. And that was really very significant. And I'll never forget the moment we, we uh, met them and we had tea uh, in St. Catherine's College one of my friend's rooms. And uh, after a while, Edith said, uh, Brown, aren't you going to say something to these young men? There were only about half a dozen of us in the room. And he held up his hand like this, and he said, the supernatural is right here. And really that sort of encapsulates everything. But I need to tell you about my background. That's wonderful. And you mentioned Labrie and its association with the Schaefer's. I tried a few weeks ago to define Labrie. It's not actually that easy. How would you describe Labrie to someone who hadn't heard of it before? I think it's very difficult to categorize. And that is the problem. But in, in, in terms of the ideas, I would say it all flowed out of the Schaefer's conviction that Christianity is really true. And the expression that he coined to kind of emphasize that he didn't mean religious truth. He meant real truth, true truth, objective truth. And so on the one side, there was this emphasis that it's true and therefore can address the questions of any society. It can challenge any alternative worldview. But on the other side, and this is where it comes close to what the we actually is, they felt that all of this had to be lived out in a humane or human context. So they had a very strong emphasis on the individual, caring about the individual, welcoming the individual, no matter what their background was. And Labrie just means the shelter, so they opened their home. And people came from a variety of backgrounds from all over the world. Uh, principally at the beginning within Europe. And they came with lots of these questions, rather like I had in my atheistic background, you see. So there was an immediate resonance for me when I met the Shavers, because he was dealing with these questions in a very practical way. So Labrie has these centers where people can go and they can study half a day, work half a day. But the whole thrust is, is basically to give people a, a chance to look at Christianity, to consider it, to ask questions, and then hopefully to come to a faith themselves. Mm. That's really helpful. So picking up the story from when you met the Schaefer's in Cambridge in 1958, uh, your life became quite entwined with the work. What shapes and forms did that take um, in the... In the well, in the I... I was really bowled over by their first contact with the Shapers in Cambridge and eventually made my way out at the end of 59 when I finished my law degree and I had started training with, uh, in theology at a Cambridge Theological College, seminary as Americans call it. And I found in my visit there, which was just a month really, that I was learning huge amounts that I was not getting anywhere else neither in the church nor in the, in the college. In fact, the college was a very liberal theological seminary. So I decided I would 
interrupt my studies at that point in theology. And I asked if I could come back to Libri. So I went back to Switzerland. There was only the one Libri at that stage. And then I met Susan, and we were engaged, and got married, and then we had our first child. And then we came back to England and started the Libri, which was in London at that stage. And that led on to my being involved, you know, in the various steps. First of all, we went, we came down to where I am right now, the Petersfield area in Hampshire in England, and we started a branch of Libri, like the one in Switzerland. And um, and then the story unfolded, and eventually I ended up in Cambridge with you all. <laughs> I think it would be helpful for people to hear what the main differences were between Schaefer's approach and perhaps you might say the the lack of an approach to serious life-sized questions in the churches at the time. Could you give us a sense of how Schaefer was different, how he stood out in well, the base, the basic thing was that he was kind of like a a, re a realization that the alternative that our own culture had adopted, namely uh, a naturalistic worldview, that is, thinking of my illustration of the supernatural right here, that the supernatural doesn't exist at all, and you only have natural, so you only have the physical. And Schaefer realized that that was not only untrue in relation to the Bible, the authority for a Christian, but it was us untrue, period, and that no one could live consistently with the idea that we are simply matter. So he had an equation, which he used a lot, uh, matter plus time plus chance equals matter. In other words, you're never going to arrive at what we find the central element in our experience, namely that we are persons and we're not machines. So his, his, the difference was that he had, as it was seen through what I call the grand deception. The reason why I call it the grand deception is that the whole of the, the culture, the whole of the civilization was deceived by this notion that you could explain things materially in science, when actually that's not possible. Science is of enormous value, but it presupposes, number one, an ordered universe that's already there. And how do you get a, an ordered universe in the first place? And then secondly, persons within that universe. And those are the presuppositions without either of those, without both of those. And particularly in terms of the scientist, if the scientist is not a person, you can forget the science, do you see? So it was a, a radical approach, um, nothing different to what you find in the New Testament with Paul, who went out into the, if you like, the capital, the uh, University of, of Greece, Athens, and he said, listen, this is foolish of you to think that uh, we're just made out of material things. And so he says, in him, we live and move and have other being, quoting from the Greek philosopher mm. of the 7th century BC. So it was this approach that we don't have to apologize. In fact, it's the opposite. We can go out and challenge this grand deception and say, listen, it's evidently not true because you, none of you can live this way. With us. And so he pointed out the inconsistencies. This was brand new for me. I've never met this, but it's not as if it was a new um, fashion. It was typically biblical, whether it's prophetic in the Old Testament or prophetic in the New. Mm. One insight which you, you had uh, early on was that it's not only non-Christians who struggle to live as human beings, but even in the church, we can sometimes struggle uh, to, to, to manifest our humanity as created by God. Um, you wrote a book, Being Human, with, with Jerem mm -hmm. Barnes. Um, would you say a few words on, on the, the, the burden of that book um, as, as, um, as it sort of appeared on the scene? Um, was it in the late 60s, early 70s? Uh, it was late 70s, I believe, yes, late 70s. Yeah, I think... Joshua, the, what we 
we felt was that the evangelical church, because it didn't have this robust confidence in the truth of Christianity. I, this sounds strange to, to say it that way, because of course they were believing the truths of the Bible. And I'm very thankful for that fact, that the evangelical church was faithful to scripture, etc. But it was all somewhat in a detached way from these kinds of discussions that we've just been, been mentioning. And as a result, spirituality felt a little bit artificial. And so the burden of our book was to say, no, listen, spirituality is the recovery of what was lost at the beginning when Adam and Eve, and then of course that raises the question, are we talking about real human beings? And we, we, were, we were arguing that they were two human beings who were made by God, this personal relationship with himself, that when they disobeyed, they were, the relationship was broken, and Gradually, there was a fragmentation of their humanity as well as a lot else, a very destructive development. And the Christianity is about the recovery of that. But it's not just salvation in the sense like, well, I believed in Jesus Christ. Though of course, that is absolutely central, make no mistake. But it was the recovery of our humanity. That is the experience which had been lost at the beginning. It was not something which had, uh, as it were, a supra-personal <laughs> dimension and uh, uh, kind of um, spirituality detached from the human. And that was our, our great burden. And it was very helpful to many, many people. They just suddenly saw that they could be creative, for example, that they could be intellectually engaged, uh, involved in social change and so on. That's really helpful. You've mentioned Cambridge as the backdrop to your first meeting with the Schaefers and then some theological study. You made a return to Cambridge, didn't you, together with Susan? Uh, could you tell us um, about that return and specifically what went into your getting involved with and then uh, refounding Christian heritage in the early 2000s? Well, it was a wonderful providence of God for us in that we had just inherited, in quotes, and that's the right word, it sounds strange, but uh, two orphans, uh, Philip and Abigail, and their parents had died, and we needed a break, and we didn't know quite where to go, but our daughter was not far from Cambridge at school, and so we looked around and we came to uh, Coton, in fact, uh, just outside Cambridge, um, in 19... Uh, let me get it right, 88. And we spent a year, uh, which was a sabbatical. And in that time, I met John Martin, and uh, he then later came down to Labri. And it was John who had this idea of using some context like Cambridge uh, for a consideration of how Christianity was the foundation of our entire civilization. But at that stage, we were just having sabbatical. And we went back to the work of Labri, and it was only in 96 that we returned uh, to, to Cambridge. We felt very led by God, but we didn't know quite what was going to be happening. It was in that context, by this time, John, John Martin had moved into the Round Church, and I went into the Round Church, and he said, oh, Ronald, I'm so glad you've come. And because he knew of my interest in Christian heritage generally. And so that was the beginning of our wondering what was going to happen to the round trip. And in due course, uh, things opened up so that the plan which the mother church, if you like, Sudan the Great, had for the building of the round trip fell through. And that opened the way for the idea that I had that it would become a center. Uh, in which these ideas could be expressed in, in relation to the, histor uh, the historical background of Cambridge and so on. But with this larger view in mind, you know, Christianity is really true and applies to the whole of life. Mm. Fantastic. So what, what role do you see Christian heritage playing in terms of, I suppose you might say, uh, 
some of the continuance of the Schaefer's work. How do you link the two? Uh, for those who are interested in understanding how, how Christian heritage differs from, yet also continues what was begun at Labrie? Well, I think the responsibility that Schaefer felt at the very beginning, the one I described to you, of challenging the modern world in this grand deception, principally, but not only in that, you know, relating it to all the issues that we need to face, the human and then the philosophical and the scientific and so on. That I think when we started Christian Heritage, we wanted it to be a statement like that in the different ways that were practical, feasible. So the strap line that we developed was recovering the past, challenging the present, and shaping the future. So the idea was that as this was a center where many visitors came each year, we could then express to them this reality that a lot of what they were going to be seeing outside there in the colleges and, and the uh, other university buildings and so on, that this was actually something which came out of the Christian worldview. And then the challenging could be in the, in the context of so recovering the past, challenging the present, i.e. in that context, pointing out that science, for example, came into existence through a Christian worldview. And of course, science is a major feature of Cambridge's history, Isaac Newton and so on. And then finally, shaping the future, we hoped, and this is still our hope, and it has already been uh, going on in, in, in different ways, but of training those who were unfamiliar with this, whatever you want to call it, this uh, world and life view, shapers, apologetics, and so on, that they would then be able to go back out into the culture and do a similar thing, whatever field they were in. Hmm. No, that's really helpful. Um, you've written that Schaefer you know, advanced a powerful critique of, uh, of materialism, the Enlightenment with its insistence on reducing everything to, to the natural. Um, but he also was quite uh, prescient, really, in his critique of postmodernism as well. Now, of course, that fully developed later on. Um, but there's a sense in which Christian heritage is well positioned, isn't it, to confront a culture which doubts not only the truth of Christianity, but also its goodness. I suppose this is a critique that goes right back to the garden, isn't it? Where, <laughs> where the serpent questions not only the, the factual nature of God's statements, but also his intentions. Um, what would you say about the challenge of witnessing in a, in a not only a post-Christian, but also a post-modern era and how the sort of ministry that we get up to at Christian Heritage addresses that? Well, to put it very simply, what we have is not something brand new in postmodernism. The very word postmodern shows you that it is related to something before. And it's absolutely vital to understand that the epistemology of postmodernism actually arose from the modernist view. And by that, I mean the big word, philosophical word, is epistemology, that the uh, grand deception began in the Enlightenment. 18th century by saying that our knowledge begins with ourselves. And we would argue that on the basis of that, that is what fragmented the whole of society, leading to a doubt about any meaning and also a basis for morality. And that undermining has then continued into the postmodern with a variation of what Schaefer called the existential methodology, by which he just meant that you no longer ask questions about truth, you ask questions about your experience. And so, to put it very crudely, the issue then becomes, how, do we, how does this feel, <laughs> rather than, is it really true, or is it really right? And the way this has more strangely, is that what started out in postmodernism seemingly to be rather much more tolerant 
that is accepting that any view was in a sense okay, whether religious or non-religious, uh, has now become something much more militant, arguing that, as you said, the whole of our history needs to be abandoned because it's 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 false, it's wrong. And the platform in which this has happened is what we today are now calling social justice. So the Christian view is now viewed as something which is detrimental to human beings because it restricts sexual experience, for example, to marriage. <laughs> that that you see is something which now is an athlete becomes an anathema in the modern mind, the postmodern mind. And so if you ask how does all of this relate, the postmodern culture, to ourselves, I think we have to be preparing or bracing ourselves uh, for a lot more pressure on the big ideas. And I think what we need to do is not anything different, but prepare ourselves for an even more clear and, uh, um, yeah, uh, explicit statement about where the sort of thing Schaefer started with, namely, uh, don't be fooled, this is a grand deception and challenge it at the area of epistemology. Hang on there and do the same sort of things that he did, exposing the weakness of, yeah, a morality, let's say, for example, in relation to sexual ethics or life, life issue, which is just hanging in space, so to speak has no foundation. I think we need to be very clear that in a gracious way, the same things are applied, the same things we started with. Only now, there's a more hostile environment. I hope that's helpful. That's very helpful and very encouraging too. Um, I wonder if we could pan out now from Cambridge, uh, pan out from the Round Church and Christian heritage and <laughs> consider uh, the UK church more generally. I wonder what you'd say are the key challenges that face us at the end of 2020 going into a new year um obviously feel free to comment on the current situation but more broadly too uh, apart from those issues highlighted by the pandemic and the response um what what's at stake currently in in the in the battle and, and what would you say to the uk church as we go into this new season or phase well that, that's a huge huge uh area to, to cover, and I, I just throw out a few ideas. Um, I think I would, I'm glad I, I mentioned how I became a Christian in Cambridge at the very beginning, in a very simple way. I went along and I heard this was called a QQ sermon, an evangelistic sermon, I, I believed, and I'm incredibly thankful for the faithfulness of the evangelical churches in the UK through the decades, through the centuries, even now, uh, in the in the light in in the face of this rejection of Christianity, and they've held on to the Bible, sola scriptura, the Reformation uh, cry, and uh, so th that is really commendable. However, as I intimated earlier, it was rather detached from all these these bigger issues, and the word I use, the phrase I use for that is sola scriptura in vacuo. That in other words, the doctrines are maintained, but they're maintained almost without any reference to the big discussions about truth that we've been talking about. Now that's not, I mean, that's an exaggeration, but, but in general, the churches haven't engaged with what I call the big question of epistemology. How do you know truth? What is truth, etc.? How does the Bible relate to that? So given that, I think the churches need to face up, first of all, to what I call the pietist hangover. Pietism was a re reform movement which started in Germany in the 18th century, and it was commendable in all sorts of ways, not least that it was evangelistically minded, etc. But it divided the picture, uh, not so much the head, but the heart, not so much the the public, that is engagement in society, but the private, my own devotion, my own faithfulness, my own godliness, and so on. And of course, it's not an either or, but in that shift, 
that was what the pietist movement led to. That opened us up to a lot of things which we haven't really addressed yet, in my view. So I found that there were very few sermons that ever helped one to understand the issues that were going on in the culture. And this cannot be true when you look at how Paul preached in his day. So he clearly had the Greeks, the Greek philosophy in mind, etc., as well as all of the superstition. So I would say that that is the one thing that has to, to be addressed. And then the second is, and this is more in relation to postmodernism, that we cannot let, let up on the emphasis on objective truth. The, the emph emphasis of the postmodern culture in which we're living is towards experience. And of course, I, I hope this is obvious from what I said earlier, we always have to engage in a humane and a human context of caring for people, accepting people, not putting them down, listening to them, etc. But there has to be within that a clear challenge to the ideas that are so inimical, not just to the Christian faith and its views, but to their own well-being. And if in the process of trying to help them on the human side, <laughs> that is, on their feeling side of it, put it that way, if we let out on the objective truth, in, in the end we have nothing to say. And so we have to be very careful, I think, going on, that we hold these two things together, the, the, the shape of the true truth. And then he wrote a book called True Spirituality, the process in which we're actually living this out. I have, that, again, it is, it's a huge subject, Joshua. That's right. Well, I, th I think that's uh, wonderful to be getting on with and, and to be appreciating that in Shaper's legacy, but also working out what that looks like for us today. Um, thank you ever so much, Randall, for joining us uh, for In Profile. It's been wonderful to have you with us, and uh, we look forward to, to hearing from you more in future. Well, thank you again. Bye, Joshua.